The T2 Tile project is building an indefinitely scalable computational stack. Follow our progress here on T Tuesday Updates. Let's get into it. Uh, uh, do you know about Nathan W. Pyle? He's got a cartoon called Strange Planet. They're very funny, these weird beings that speak very literally. I really like this one. I wanted to show it for a sec. You can figure out what it is they're talking about. But uh, uh, the payoff here, our trust is based solely on proximity, says one. The other says mutual. And, you know, that's it. That's the spatial computing principle for security. So uh, uh, Nathan Pyle's got that right. Uh, uh, all right, catching up on the uh, science fiction novel, Best Effort. Uh, I'm supposed to be producing 2,000 words a week. Last week, in the first week of December, I had produced 93 words a week. This week, uh, I did a little bit better, and I pulled my average up to 347 words uh, a week. I've actually done a little bit more than that because I, I did another one of these dictation things and I did much of a scene that I haven't yet boiled down and put it into the uh, the tech file so yeah I, I've got more words that I haven't quite got credit for getting 2,000 a week hmm, not so likely but at least things are moving uh, uh, okay back to the joys of software how much of this stuff can I uh, <laughs> not resist telling you about even though oh uh, it's such an incredible pain uh, uh, so now was the point uh, that I had built the image on my workstation and transferred going to transfer it to SD card and put it on the Vega Bones and start doing additional customization there. Run the scripts that would do all of the downloading the packages, compiling, blah, 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 because I'm doing all of that on the Beagle Bone rather than trying to set up what they call a cross compilation environment because I haven't had very good luck with them and I just prefer to use the real thing even if it's slower. So we've talked about SystemD uh, and their their SystemD journal and all these starting, starting, started, started stuff. That's all SystemD running. That's now in charge of getting a Linux box booted up on essentially all Linux systems. A lot of people hate it, and I have to say I do too. <laughs> I, you know, I, try, <laughs> I understand that I'm an, uh, I'm an ignoramus. I don't know how to do it. I'm not expert, but I've tried to use it quite a bit now, and you know, it, it replaces something that was totally simple. It was a bunch of directories with a bunch of files in it, and the files would get executed in alphabetical order. So if you wanted something to come earlier, you gave it a smaller number at the beginning. And, you know, that had lots of problems, and I understand why they wanted to, to replace it with something more integrated. But this thing is a monolithic beast. It's a pain in the butt. And it's got so much complexity that for such as me, I mean, I'm not, you know, completely inexperienced. I understand what a dependency graph is. I still... <laughs> this thing to work you know do i want type simple or type forking or who knows uh, uh the long and short of it is one of the reasons i was taking the time in december this year to go to advance to uh, a, a more recent version of uh linux i went from 3.8 to 4.14 uh was to try to get a fresher version of systemd because i was getting this non-deterministic strange behavior in old systemd and googling around it it was like oh you just have to get a newer version well i got a newer version i'm still getting strange non-deterministic behavior uh, um, yeah, and Oh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, and one of the problems with being a monolithic system is you can't just use editors to go in and look at the files because that's not the way they're stored. They have this whole internal thing. So when uh, systemd gets failures, it gives you little messages saying, oh, type system control status systemd temp file set up for more information. So the thing managed to come up. So I did that. And no, uh, <laughs> the program crashes because it didn't actually get set up enough to use systemd's control. Great. Uh, uh, try journal control. There's a thing that's going to sh sh show me the logs about what went wrong. No, can't use that either. Uh, um, one of its features that it's supposed to be great at is that it can tell you where all the boot time went. And I wouldn't mind knowing where that boot time went, especially because the T2 tiles take forever to boot. But, so here's the top three, 56 seconds, most of a minute. And where is that? And that's in starting up the, the MMC, starting up the flash drive and no further details. Maybe there's a way that I can get it to tell me more information about that. But at the moment, it doesn't help. Startup service, splash screen service. Okay, that's where the time went. How to fix it? Who knows? 
what I've started doing is trying to migrate as much of my own behavior, my own functionality, boot up functionality, out of System D entirely into older stuff. Cron is a, a mechanism for starting jobs that you can do uh, on, on boot time and so forth. And it's still having troubles, but I think, you know, we'll take it as we go. Another issue, I uh, started getting to my Linux kernel modules that, you know, they're all going to have to get modified. And I was having this weird thing when the ITCs, the, this is the Linux kernel module controlling locks between the neighboring tiles. When it was trying to come up, it was getting permission failures, E minus uh, one, uh, when it tried to allocate the pins. I couldn't figure it out. I tried a zillion things. Uh, uh, I was getting an unrelated, I was getting kernel oops from the other uh, Linux kernel module and so forth. So I was unloading modules and putting them back in and so forth eventually i noticed uh oh that's strange so this these uh, messages up here are from unloading the lock module here's the messages from trying to reload it and the second time you load it it worked I don't know why this is happening, but I went back and I modified my kernel module to free the pins before I allocate them the very first time. Why did I need to free them? I don't know, but now it's working. Uh, at the same time, I'm having problems as well with ITC packet. That's the thing that actually sends the packages back and forth. All kinds of issues with that. Uh, it turned out, oh, the way that I was trying to start the coprocessors by echoing this text into a thing, ah, it doesn't work anymore. Now you have to put stop and start into these things. Okay, I can try to do that. Echo start into the thing. Oh, what do you know? It actually bought it. And with that, eventually I got the thing to start coming up. Now I still didn't have the screen doing anything. That was a whole other issue. I've been using this thing called FBTFT frame buffer for little things. Uh, it had some limitations. It wasn't quite right for the way that the T2 tile board worked, but it was the closest thing, and, it, and I got it working. That's what was working on the old version. Uh, but this time, it is interesting that I felt like, you know, I understand Linux kernel modules a lot better than I did when I first set these things up. And I said, well, why don't I just get my own copy of the source code for this thing? And then I, instead of just necessarily modifying configuration files that I don't understand. If I need to, I could just modify the code and install my own module. So I went and found it. The FBTFT uh, package is in the staging area, which is, you know, not quite good enough to be real Linux, but it kind of travels along with Linux. I got the, I, I caught the code. I modified the thing. I stuck in my own reset method. That's where I was going to need to make an intervention because I don't, I'm not actually using the reset pin on the display, but I have another pin that controls the whole power to the thing. And I wanted to say, well, maybe I can use the power control as some kind of reset thing if I put the appropriate delays in. First step was to say, can I get my own code to run? And the way you do that <clears throat> is you try to do it and just put a message that'll show up in the log. And sure enough, I got it to show up in the log. So that was, I was on my way and I got the thing to heat up. It, it, <laughs> now it's weird. It's turned out that the existing reset code that the default does is actually exactly what I need, even though I'm handing it the power pin rather than an official reset pin. It leaves it high and every so often when you want to reset it pulls it low for a little while then pulls it high again and leaves it that way for quite some time which is what's necessary for my hardware circuits to do their resetting and then goes on about its business so so far it seems like i don't even really need to have my own copy of the uh the linux kernel module for the screen as long as i just tell it that it can take the power pin and use it as a reset pin but i'm keeping this stuff because i'm hoping to get screen blanking and coming out of screen blanking where Working later on. Shortly after that, I managed to get some uh, actual the text up on the screen. Sometimes it's single space, sometimes it's double space. I don't understand why. And I finally got the splash screen back as well. Hooray! Uh, um, then it was on to everything else, trying to compile the <coughs> code for the coprocessors so that I could start sending packets back and forth with MFM, error after error after error. Whenever you see <coughs> asterisks, especially three asterisks in a row, <coughs> that means you're in trouble. Uh, I saw a lot of them this week. Uh, so I started just kind of 
just figuring out what's going on. It couldn't find this thing. So I gave it a path to find it. And, and then I tried to build it and its program will not fit into available memory. Oh my God. I mean, so the coprocessors have very tiny little memory and there's basically 4k, uh, well, there's basically 8k available, uh, for the program code. And I had optimized it pretty well to use up most of it, but, uh, you know, fit. Now it doesn't fit. Uh, people uh, on the net were having the same kind of issues. The can't find sys cdefs, same thing I did, and so forth. And they were doing the same thing, including the thing doesn't fit, doesn't fit. Turned out it was the wrong solution. The, uh, the right solution is to go back and put a sim link uh, to connect these two unrelated directories that really don't need to be connect, didn't need to be connected in the old version. Now they do. Uh, um, yeah, errors, errors, errors. Eventually, okay, it finally started working when I made this special link, uh, uh, and it built, and that meant I could actually go start working on MFM, which takes like a half an hour to build <laughs> the whole compilation stage on the Beagle Bone, but it actually built. Hooray! So, we have MFM T2, it's got all kinds of problems uh, that I still haven't dealt with, but it is running under Linux under Debian 9.11, Linux 4.14. So, okay, progress in the Red Queen, two steps forward. Uh, uh, so at that point, that meant it was time to uh, take the customized that all this work that had been happening on the what's going to be the red key master and get those bits off it into an image that I can then stamp onto everything else. And I had found in the distribution, they had a file uh, called, you know, BeagleBone Black EMMC Flasher or something like that, that I got the impression from Googling it, that it would take the copy of what's on the flash drive and copy it back to a SD card, just what I needed. Now, and then I ran it and it said script halting system unrecognized. Okay, what's that about? Well, I found out quick enough. There's a readme file in that directory saying, uh, warning, uh, do not use these, <laughs> do not use these things. They're just more traps. <sighs> So that was aggravating. But eventually I figured out, hey, uh, the the flash drive on the BeagleBones is 4 gigabytes. Well, all of my little SD cards, the smallest ones I could find, were 8 gigabytes, which I was aggravated for, but that's the way it is. But if it's 8 gigabytes, that means I could make two partitions, each being 4 gigabytes. I could boot off of one partition and copy onto the other partition all at once. And that's, in fact, what I did and managed to get that to work. And so I copied the reverse image, all customized, and get it back back into uh, an SD card, which I could then start stamping out. So I took my one and only power zone, which has been hanging for around for the last week since we got the uh, uh, improved pipe hangers going for them, and I disassembled the whole thing, ended up with a giant bowl full of inner tile connectors, and took them apart and started taking the case off, flashing them, putting the case back, and so forth. And it took most of the morning, but uh, eventually, and there's the cat, uh, um, I did the whole power zone plus a couple more. Uh, I hung it back up and I plugged it in. And pretty much everybody heated up, not exactly everybody heated up, still having system D issues. I think still having some kind of issues for sure. In addition, uh, as I just sort of looked around going back and forth between the MFM T2 display and the, uh, the visualization display, I was finding a weird issue in the lower left hand corner there. And in particular, there was this minus SN plus SN between these two tiles. That's bad news. That means sync failures between uh, and then reacquiring sync and then losing sync, which seems to me at this point pretty much means a hardware issue. And so I started doing, well, up, plugging and unplugging these things, uh, just like, you know, field service always does, you know, just replace parts until the problem goes away. And it turned out, I think, to be the, the southwest connection of this upper tile may have some kind of issue. Uh, so I marked it as having some kind of issue. I actually, I marked it on the front uh, as well, because, you know, uh, let's not field this thing uh, by mistake. Uh, and, you know, again, we're going to expect that there's going to be some issues, hopefully not a lot of issues, but step by step. 
with a replacement in there, uh, we got uh, Northeast and Southwest now talking to each other, great guns. They don't make any sense because the intertile stuff at the MFM level still totally needs work, but one step at a time. Uh, I also had one that I could not get to come up no matter what, power cycled and everything. It turned out the disc was really messed up, too messed up to fix itself. So I took all these, you know, fix it, fix it, fix it. And then I said, well, screw it. I'll just go back and get my little flash card and reflash the thing. And it was fine. So that was nice. Uh, uh, and so it, it's working. All right. And that's it. That's where we're at. It's kind of working. It's got a lot left to do, but a lot of progress. And okay. We are 10 weeks from the deadline to submit scientific papers to the A-Life conference. I want to do a lot more than that. I, uh, so uh, March 1st is for the papers and abstracts. And, you know, we need to have some kind of science for that. I'm thinking probably maybe something having to do with those bond stuff that we were working on it would probably be the right mix of doable, but we could get some interesting stuff rather than focusing again on the cell membrane because that's a lot of work. We'll see. Uh, I'm if people want to work on it, I really do. But there's also the call for art robotics displays and visualizations, and that's where the hardware is going to be going. That's not until May 15th, but we need to know way ahead of time what kind of things we're doing. So I'm encouraging people, if they have uh, ULAM skills or SPLAT skills or are willing to play with it, to think about making some stuff that might be fun to run on the big grid. It doesn't have to be complex cells. It can be, you know, the sand boys, that kind of thing, uh, uh, that might just look cool. And in fact, being a little bit simpler might be easier on the beagle bones, be easier on the T2 tiles, because they're going to be running pretty slow. Uh, um, but I would love to get as many people as possible represented in this uh, thing when it's running in the middle of July of next year. Okay, that's where we're at. I'm going to be counting down the 10 weeks to uh, March 1st. We're probably going to have another wall of science. Well, we'll see. I'm not sure. That's it for this week. Next week is almost Christmas. It's Christmas Eve, but we shall see. Have a good week.